interesting way of how to establish causality and that is basically about the link between non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and insulin resistance and, and it basically talks about the use of mendelian randomization analysis between the association of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and insulin resistance so this is a new way in which you are trying to link up causality from one aspect to the other in that regards now we all know that type 2 diabetes and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are pretty much mixed in that perspective once you eat if you have excessive amount of fatty acids they then get deposited into the various visceral components of the body so there are two aspects where you can deposit your uh, fat one could be at the level of the skin so you have got the cutaneous deposition which fat is not going to do a harm to you and you will have deposition in the liver which is the visceral fat and it is this visceral fat or the fatty liver in a very simple term which is responsible for various problems which happen in that perspective and uh, we all know that this fatty liver may probably cause insulin resistance and this would ultimately result in development of type 2 diabetes now when you look into the way we associate fatty liver with diabetes there is always a question whether the insulin resistance is driving the fatty liver or is it the fatty liver which is driving the diabetes now there are different aspects people are saying one is a very mechanical hypothesis which say that if you have got too much fat and it gets deposited into the liver it causes insulin resistance and because of that insulin resistance you develop diabetes the other is that because you've got more fat you develop insulin resistance and that insulin resistance causes this fatty liver so this whole concept becomes important to understand as to what is the role does fatty liver itself have a role in the development of this whole process or it's just a bystander like it is another of the manifestation of insulin resistance this becomes important because this will be relevant from a clinical perspective as well and this is what they're going to address you using a very important thing so we all know that 50 percent of obese children do have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease now we need to understand that NAFLD is different from NASH. So when you say NASH, which means that already there is a hepatic damage which has happened, it is associated with diabetes. Now which is the cause, which is the effect is the question. So they basically started off with this hypothesis to evaluate the role of NAFLD as a causative agent to type 2 diabetes. Now whether having NAFLD increases your prevalence of diabetes is what they're going to address the question. Now, if you look into that, because we're talking about young children, type 2 diabetes may not have happened in many of them. That's why they basically used a surrogate marker of insulin resistance, which will suggest that subsequently they may develop diabetes. So they tried to evaluate the comparison between NAFLD and insulin resistance. Now, Pratik, how if you are asked to make a study design to look at how NFLD is linked with insulin resistance, what design would you look at? What will be the positive and the negative aspect from that? So how will you study whether NFLD is so causing diabetes or not? Lines which are there. So conventionally what you can do is that you do a descriptive study. You just basically look at the people who have got uh, obese children who are coming to you. You look at their insulin resistance and then you classify them into NFLD or no NFLD. Then you see if somebody has got NAFLD, what's the odds ratio of them having a high insulin or an insulin resistance? So that could be a simple descriptive study, but that will only give you odds ratio. It's not going to tell you whether this is actually causing that or not. So this means that this may again the cause and effect becomes an important issue. So there will be confounders. The other way is to do a logistic regression. So when you look at logistic regression, basically it looks at multiple factors and then based upon those multiple factors, you decide which one of them are significant independent of the confounding variables. So that could be a regression. But again, this is not going to give you causality. Now, when you talk about anything in medicine, you are actually looking at causality. Now, when you, what is the difference between causality and in terms of just association? I'll just give you an example. If you study at the risk of osteoporosis in women, there will be various risk factors which will come up. They will look into the bone density. They will look into the calcium intake. They will look into the age of menopause and all those things. 
Now, studies will show that if you have premature menopause, it is associated with a higher, lesser risk of a premature menopause is associated with a higher risk of developing fractures, which is fine. But that does not mean causality. When you say causality, it means that if you actually delay the menopause, the fractures will come down. This is the other way. So there's a difference between there. So what they're showing is that premature menopause may be associated with a greater risk of fracture, but whether delaying menopause, now you're, I'm not concerned about this is a risk factor or not, I'm concerned how I can modify that. Now, if I delay menopause, does it improve? That answer is not given by that association. So regression will just tell you that this is associated. It will not go into causality. So randomization is the way forward. So the best way is that you make half of them NAFLD and half of them non-NAFLD. And then they are randomized. And then you see what is the difference in terms of their insulin resistance. And then you will get the likelihood ratio, the estimate, the hazard, and all those things become important. So what I'm trying to say is that most of studies that you read are descriptive. And they do a lot of regression analysis. But at the end of the day, they will just say that this is just an association. They do not prove causality. For proving causality, you need a actual randomized study in that regard. Now, if you want to look at causality, when you say that this is a cause, smoking is causing cancer, you need to fulfill various criteria. We've discussed this earlier also. It has to be the strength of association. So it has to be a strong association first. If there is no association, there will be no causality. Second, there would be consistency. So not only you, but 100 other centers are also showing that NAFLD is causing insulin resistance. That is important. Third, it should be a temporal relationship. So you need to prove that smoking is happening before and then cancer is happening. So this also becomes important because others will say that cancer causes smoking. So that becomes important in terms of temporal relationship. The fourth aspect, of course, is the dose response. So if somebody says that if you have a, a fatty liver, you have got more insulin resistance. If you develop steatohepatitis, it becomes worse. If you develop real fibrosis, it becomes worse. That is the dose response. If you take five cigarettes, the chance is 5%. If you take 20 cigarettes a day, it becomes 50%. This is the dose response. So not only are they associated, not only they are consistent, they are temporally related, and there is a dose response which is there. Very importantly, it has to be plausible. If you just think of an implausible thing, there's nothing going to happen. Like if you say that if you have got uh, osteoarthritis of the leg, that will cause you Alzheimer's. These may be associations, but this is not biologically plausible. So it has to be a biological plausibility, which is important. And then at the end of it, the final thing that you will look at in terms of causality is ultimately an experiment, which is what we're talking about randomization. So why causality is important? Because all your interventions will depend upon causality. You won't just go for association. Your interventions depend upon causality. And the second basic thing is that that requires a proper randomization to assess that. Now, if I give you just some examples. So if you're looking at obesity and high blood pressure, you're doing a study. And somebody says that using red bags, somebody studied that and they found that red bags are associated with obesity. Could this be causality? Pratik? Of course, no. This is just an association. There is no biological plausibility. Somebody says that those people who study in this board are more obese than that board. There could be some plausibility, but again, you'll think about various other factors, whether this is a confounding factor. So somebody who is studying in this particular board may be uh, having less physical activity compared to the other board. So it's not a direct causality. It's a confounding factor. But if somebody says that if you have got more obesity, you've got higher blood pressure, you might think that, okay, this could be an association. This looks like biological plausible. Let's do some experiment in that regard. Now, how do you really settle between association and causation in that regard? There are various factors which have to look at. So if we say that obesity is linked with hypertension, it may be the truth. This is a true cause and this is a cause in that sense. Or there could be a problem in the way you are assessing your obesity or the way you are assessing your blood pressure. If there is a fault, so there could be a systematic error which is causing that. There could be a chance. So you, it's just that it's by chance you have found this association. 
And finally, and most importantly, you're looking at confounders. So when you have an association between two, first of all, look at whether it is just by a chance. So if you have seen in multiple studies, it can't be chance. Look at your tools, how you're measuring BP, how you're measuring weight, that may be wrong. If it's also right, that's fine. And finally, you take care of everything else. So obese children are taking more salt and that salt will cause hypertension. More fat diet is causing both hypertension and obesity. So it may be downstream the pathway. So what we are trying to say is that if obesity is causing hypertension, decreasing obesity will decrease hypertension. That is what you're looking at ultimately. But if it is a confounding factor, then you will not get it. So you have to look into all that regards in this situation. So what we need to understand is that we need to be very careful in terms of evidence base, which is there. But also you have to look at that everything is not evidence based. It's not easy to identify evidence everywhere. So we need to be cautious in terms of common sense and biological plausibility as this cartoon is basically depicted. Now let's come back to another example as to how you will look into causality. So we know, and this I talked about in terms of the menopausal bone fracture, but if you look at peak bone mass, we know that bone mass is regulated by multiple factors. These includes genetics, which is 60 to 80 percent. You have got uh, physical activity 10 to 20 percent, nutrition and hormones. Now, if somebody says that low calcium intake will cause a decrease in terms of peak bone mass. That is the hypothesis. So the question is, there is association. Is it causation or not? So what you can do in that regards is that you have to focus on all the other factors because calcium intake may be associated with nutrition. Those people who may have more calcium intake may be more physically active. So again, there could be an issue with regards to the confounding factor. And they may also have some hormonal factors because calcium can increase some hormones which causes bone. So now the final question still remains unanswered as to whether your calcium is causing the bone or you have some other factor which is coming into that picture. So what you can do in that regards is ideally you do a randomized trial. You start giving calcium from zero years to 50,000 children and you follow them up to 25 years of age and then you show half are getting calcium, half are not getting calcium and then you are finally fine. So this is what is the proof which is there. But is this feasible Narayanan? It is impossible. So a lot of these things like suppose somebody says that cigarette smoking causes cancer. You say okay half get cigarette, half don't get cigarette, I'll see after 50 years. You can't do these sort of things. So although when you talk about truth, you say randomization is important. But that is not feasible. It is very expensive. It is very complicated and it may be ethically impossible to do in that setting. So basically the new way of looking at it, when, uh, when do we get randomized? That is a very important idea. So when you talk about uh, life, it gives you an opportunity of randomization. All of us are random creations. All of us have got genetics, which is different. So that different genetics provides us an opportunity to look at the impact of one to the other. So what I'm trying to say is that let's say everybody is having similar environment, everything else, still somebody will have low calcium intake and somebody will have high calcium intake. And maybe there are some genes which will regulate the calcium intake. If you know that these genes are regulating the calcium intake, and then you just correlate these genes with this peak bone mass, you will actually give more to the causality and all the environmental factors have been taken care of. This is the fundamental basis of Mendelian randomization. So this sounds a bit confusing, a bit counterintuitive, but I'll try to explain it again that Mendelian randomization is a way of finding causality based upon genetic predisposition to a particular condition and its association to its effect. So we'll come back to this again and again, but this is a very, very powerful tool which is now available and which has been increasingly used in discerning a lot of these problems which were difficult to identify. So this is what they have used and that is why I have chosen specifically this paper and I've been trying to put a lot of introduction here, but we need to really get new this thing is going to come up multiple times. You will hear about this much more. This is going to be a way to identify the pathophysiology. Now, how they did it in this paper, you will get the idea again from that. 
So let's go back to this. The question is, is NAFLD causing insulin resistance? That's the basic question that you have to answer. So now we need to understand that are there any genetic predisposers to NAFLD? Let's say you've got two individuals who are absolutely same in terms of uh, nutrition, in terms of physical activity, in terms of everything, body fat, everything. Do you think they will have the same risk of NAFLD or not print risk? Because there will be some genetic predispositions which may cause that. So in case of NAFLD, there are these three genes which have been associated with a much higher risk of fat. So a variation in PNPLA3 causes 75% more liver fat. So just one variation. So what they started off was that there are three particular genes which are varied or if they are in a different uh, form. So when you talk about uh, basically mutations, so mutations are what? They're also variations, but these variations are pathological. These may not be pathological. These are just one single amino acid here and there. But if these alterations are there, it poses a risk of developing fatty liver. So what they found that these three are the major genes which influence this. And these are not linked with insulin resistance. Now again, suppose these three are also linked with insulin resistance indirectly through some mechanism that will be gone. That's why they removed one gene which was glucokinase. So they, it has been shown that glucokinase predisposes to fatty liver, but glucokinase is also responsible for diabetes. So of course, you need to be careful about that. So they, they found these three genes are predisposing to liver disease. And then based upon these three, you get a cumulative genetic risk for that. And based upon that, you know that this may cause NAFLD. Now, you can use conventional statistics to see whether NAFLD is associated with insulin resistance or not, which is a simple thing because that's what we do all the time. And then you see how these genetic risks are associated with insulin resistance. So let's put it this way. You know that A to B is 80 kilometers, B to C is 120 kilometers, A to C is this much. So how much is this correlated you will be able to identify. So if you assume that the effect of the genetic risk is through NAFLD. You know that this much should be the effect. And if you find that the same effect is there from A to C directly, it means that the genetic effect is valid. This is the basic principle of Mendelian randomization. And I'll talk about that a bit later. So if your variation of genetic risk on insulin resistance is same as the fatty liver on insulin resistance, this should mean that this is actually true in that perspective. So now, how did they go about the study? It was a very simple study. They chose patients who came to them with obesity, basically constitutional obesity. And this was a good number. 900 patients were there. Excluded, of course, the secondary criteria, all the uh, syndromic cases, endocrine cases, all the possible causes which can cause fatty liver were also excluded. So it's like a pure run-of-the-mill obesity patient who came to them. Then what they did was that they did an ultrasound. So they did an ultrasound and then there was the same sonographer who graded that this is fatty liver or not. They did not look at NASH, they looked at fatty liver. Now, what they did was HOMA IR. So there were two measures, one for fatty liver, which is ultrasound, and one for insulin resistance, which was HOMA IR. So they just did these two things. And now, based upon that, they started doing some very interesting statistics to see whether this was associated or not. So first thing they did was that, that based upon these three, they proceeded a genetic risk score. So there are ways in which you can model them up. Okay, you've got a 5% risk, 10% risk. So based upon these three genes, they developed a genetic risk. And then they did a regression of this genetic risk with NAFLD, which was a simple linear regression. And this value was known as beta X. So this is basically telling you how much this genetic risk is affecting fatty liver. So what component of NAFLD is being caused by this genetic risk? Second, they calculated how much NAFLD is affecting the HOMA IR. And this they gave a beta a linear regression. They gave it uh, basically corrected it for age, gender and BMI. So all those things which could influence independent of that, how much fatty liver is affecting your insulin resistance. And they gave this name as beta Y. Now, why did they lock transform the HOMA IR? Do you lock transform derivatives? Basically, if you don't have a normal distribution, 
you convert it into a log and sometimes then you will get a log transform. So then it becomes a normal distribution. So that's why they log transformed into it. So two measures which they got was beta X, the effect of genetic risk on fatty liver and the effect of fatty liver on HOMA IR was beta Y. So you're going from uh, this place to let's say Regency and from there you're going to a third place, you're getting this route, you're getting the idea. Now, the other thing was simple. You calculate the effect of this genetic risk on the home IR. You go directly to that. Suppose you are, let's put it very simply. Suppose you're going from here to place A to place B and you're going to place C. So one, you are saying A to B, B to C, and the second route is A to C. If both are equal, it means it's 100%. That means that route is through that. So your connection of A to C is through B in that situation and this is what it is showing. So this is a very, very interesting way to understand is that if your genetic risk going through the fatty liver, going to the insulin resistance is the same as your direct risk, it means the liver is the mechanism between that. You got it? So this is the very basic concept. So then you get another regression. So you multiply beta X to beta Y and this becomes the expected this is the expected thing. So you're going from A to B is 80 kilometers, B to C is 20 kilometers, expected is 100 kilometers. If your A to C is also 100 kilometers in the same direction, that means you are going through B. So if your genetic risk is going through liver, it means that fatty liver is causing the insulin resistance. This is the nutshell. And then you actually look at the actual linear regression between this genetic risk and that, and that gives you the actual beta Z. So in a way, actual distance between A to Z and the expected difference between A to Z will tell you whether this route is through that path or not. This is what Mendelian randomization is all about. So if your actual and expected are same, it is same, closer, closer, further, further. So this is a very, very simple way of looking at causality from one to the other in that regards. Now what they did was that they compared NAFLD without NAFLD individuals. So it is very clear that individuals who had fatty liver had a much higher HOMA IR score, which means that if you have NAFLD, you have got more insulin resistance. Everybody will be happy. This is where our story ends. We'll say, okay, we'll publish a paper saying that NAFLD is associated with worse insulin resistance profile. But then the nothing is, you're not getting anything out of it. You don't know whether it is a causality, a association, confounding, whatever. So, but this is what they found. And this was, if you look at the p-value, is 1.7 to the 10 to the power 20 minus 20. So the way they are reporting p-value is also very, very interesting. So it's like 0, 0.00, like 20 times 0, 0.01. So it's like a hugely significant. But it doesn't tell you anything. It just tells you that there is an association between NAFLD and HOMA IR score. <clears throat> now, then they did a linear regression. So first step was whether the genetic predisposition which they calculated actually holds true or not as to how much that genetic predisposition affects NAFLD. So what they found was that there was a 1.66 times odds ratio. So if you had a genetic predisposition, you were 66% times chances more that you will have a fatty liver. This is what it is coming at. And the beta X, which was the beta X I told you, was the association regression coefficient between genetic risk and that was 0.2. So what they tried to say is that if you've got one standard deviation score increase in the genetic risk, 20% chance of fatty liver increase. This is what they found. So this was association. So beta X was 9.2. Don't go into other statistics. Beta X was 0.2. Now, if you really look at the next aspect and you compare HOMA IR, and NAFLD. So this was the second line. So we go from point A to B, there is a connection. Now we are going from B to C. And between B to C again, you find that yes, there was a beta coefficient which was 0.28, which was significant. So on regression, on simple analysis also, we said that NAFLD was associated with worse this thing. This also shows the same. So here the beta Y was 0.28. So now you know the distance between A to B and B to C. Now you can estimate the distance between A to C. So what you do, you multiply both of them. So expected beta Z was 0 0.056. 
Now, if your actual beta Z is 0.056, it's 100%. If it is 0.028, it is 50%. If it is zero, it is zero. So this is how you can then build up an association. So what they have done is they associated genetic risk to fatty liver, fatty liver to insulin resistance. Now, what about genetic risk and insulin resistance directly? What are you seeing here? This is 0 0.007. This is the actual beta coefficient. And what was I expected? 0 0.056. So it is not going the same direction. So if it was that your genetic risk is causing fatty liver, then the fatty liver is causing insulin resistance. In that case, you would say, okay, it should be 0 0.05, 0 0.04, whatever. It is 0 0.007 means that there is no link up as far as NAFLD and type 2 diabetes. Now, what does it mean from a clinical perspective? It means that there are a lot of confounding factors which are causing both of them. So you've got, this is causing uh, fatty liver, this is causing insulin resistance, but they are not connected with each other. This is a big message coming out. So if you treat fatty liver, your diabetes is not going to be corrected in that uh, situation. So this is a big message coming out there that they, although they are associated, this is not a causality. So this is a very simple way of doing that. But of course, you require a lot of these genetic studies and all those things. But this is the way it is going to happen. So the actual beta was 0 0.007. The expected beta was 0 0.056, which means that fatty liver is not causing insulin resistance. This is a very, very interesting way to go forward. So if you now look at this, our equation, your beta X was 0.2 for genetic risk to liver. From liver to insulin resistance was 0.28. The uh, multiplication was 0 0.056. This was the expected, but the actual was 0 0.007. So if you want, you can say that the explanation was around 10%. If at all, there was only 10% explanation, which is useless. So which basically means that the effect on insulin resistance is not through the liver and liver is not causing insulin resistance. So basically, so basically they, uh, they, for vice versa, you have to go the other way around. What you need to do is that which genes predispose to insulin resistance, and then you go ahead from that C to B, B to A. So insulin resistance, genetic risk to insulin resistance to fatty liver, and then those genes directly. So they try to do the same in the adult data because see what, is that, what you need. You need some basic information about fatty liver. And you need all the genome-wide data. Many now things are available on the net. So they used a 40,000 adult data. And then they found the same thing. That insulin resistance did not cause fatty liver. So which means that something is causing both of them. Neither this is causing that or not that is causing this. So the, what does it mean in terms of clinical practice? If you improve insulin resistance, you may not improve fatty liver. Did you get the message? Because insulin resistance is not causing fatty liver. So if you give metformin, it is not going to help. So this is a very big thing which is coming out of it. If you say, okay, I correct fatty liver, my diabetes will be fine. No, this is a different thing altogether. So these are the important implications which come out of this sort of study. So although this looks very complicated, which is actually very complicated, but if you understand, this is a very interesting way of delineating the associations between two different situations in that regards. So in this case, the actual and the expected did not match. So it was not that what they've clearly showed was that NFLD is not causally related with insulin resistance. And they found that the HOMA IR, and this is the adult data they found was zero. From insulin resistance to fatty liver was zero, even worse. So it does not really get associated on that. Now what they're trying to say is that why is this happening? Because epidemiological studies show that those who have fatty liver have got more diabetes. Now if you had done a randomized trial, you would have at birth, made 50% fatty liver and 50% normal and followed up for 20 years to see what happens. But that's a very, very difficult thing to do. So this is why this Mendelian randomization comes into the picture. What they're saying is that they used fatty liver and not steatohepatitis. Maybe if you had used more severe cases, it would have worked better in that situation. Second, they are again saying that this generic fatty liver, so that's what we also say, this fatty liver is of no consequence per se. If you are interested, look at liver fibrosis. This is what they're trying to say. 
and they are trying to say is that there are various factors which are common to both pathways but they are essentially not the causative thing so as we have discussed earlier the main part in medicine is causality and none of your descriptive studies none of your regression analysis they might sound very good they are not going to give you the answer for that you need a experiment and this experiment could be a randomized trial or this experiment could be the nature's experiment which has happened by the genes you have got so this is a very very interesting way to really look into the various aspects of uh, the various forms and this probably will uh, be hearing much more on that there are two papers in jcm only about mendelian randomization and this is something which is very very in the concept of causality we need to prove that there is a association between the two things that there which is consistent which has got a time course so that the cause keep came before effect it is having a dose effect so higher the dose higher the response this is biologically plausible and then you do a experiment these are the six criteria for causality so if we say that somebody <coughs> who is smoking is having cancer you will have to show that it has got a consistent association 5 is causing less 50 is causing more smoking has to come before and then cancer will come later and ideally you need to have a experiment saying that 50% are having smoking 50% not which is not possible now what this concept is doing the mendelian randomization is doing is that they assume that at birth we are genetically randomized everybody has got different sets of genes so if you have let's say uh, somebody who is having same food same diet same lifestyle same physical activity one will be more predisposed to fatty liver one will be less predisposed to fatty liver which is independent of environment it has nothing to do so you have taken off the environment part so what they do is that they have looked into large genome databases and said that okay if you look at these three particular genes that 20 30% chance more is there for you to develop fatty liver just because of these genes so what they then do in mendelian randomization is that they look at that genetic risk how much that genetic risk is explaining your fatty liver because rest is environment this is genetics and then how much fatty liver is explaining the insulin resistance correcting for age bmi all those the environmental factors so this is a pure effect which is coming so pure effect you are going from point a to point b and point b to point c you know the total effect now you actually look the other way around that what is the effect of those genes on the insulin resistance so that is point a to point c directly so if you are going from here to here and here if it is 100 km and this is also 100 km in the same direction it mean that you are in the right path so that meant that thing is going through the liver but if you say that the association there is so weak that it you are taking 1000 km to reach there it mean that it is not related to the fatty liver so they do a regression from point a to point b point c to point uh, b to c and then c to a if they are matching it means it is associated not matching it is not associated if it is associated means now then you can say it is causative not results associated that mean that is important like in that video they were discussing that if you say that premature menopause is associated with reduced uh, with increased fracture rate it does not mean that delaying menopause will decrease fracture rate so if you prove that premature menopause is a causation then delaying menopause will happen so if you say that fatty liver is a big chance of dying dying okay but then treating fatty liver is not good at all if it is it is associated causation becomes that perspective so this is what is the whole concept it's a complicated one but i think very very important way of doing this basically we are sort of doing a genome wide association study for our patients where we for the uh, initially in the group of people where we want to test and then we are randomizing them according to their risk no no no, no. So basically what basically has happened what is happened there is already a lot of data available on the net that these are the four genes which are causing this particular problem you use that database and then in your group of population you study those genes yeah. <laughs> in that in those group of population you compare the genetics yes yeah with the data yes and then see the results yes, yes. then you come to that into account. it done 
and they've done the other thing that they've got already wide database available for adults 40000 adults in which they have information about fatty liver insulin resistance and genes so they just use that data and got a result so if this is already been done you don't need to really do the whole experiment or if you definitely show that insulin resistance is causing pcos then i'll be really happy that giving metformin in that case will be helpful or giving uh, estrogen progesterone to decrease pcos will be helpful in diabetes so these sort of things will i think come up very quickly people will have all the databases coming up they will analyze so suppose you have 1000 patient with pcos you do their genetic profile you know these three genes are predisposing them to pcos you look at their fat uh, metabolic profile and then you see whether this is cause which one is causative and then you can come up okay yes pcos is causing in diabetes or not or it is the diabetes or insulin resistance which is causing pcos so till now you had to do a experiment in the lab to prove that even then nothing is going to come up this could be a very good way of showing the causation on that